NFTs within video games are going to bring the first billion users to crypto. Uh, and that this community that of 3 billion gamers globally or 2.5 billion gamers globally already collect and enjoy and understand digital assets. They spend the money on these digital assets to use them in games. And so they're a perfect community to sort of bring over into the crypto space and say, hey, well, what if you actually own this asset? What if you had more privileges with this asset through true, true ownership? All right. Welcome back, everybody, to Altcoin Daily. My name's Austin, here with my brother Aaron, and awesome guest today, longtime friend of the channel, has his own YouTube channel, Elio Trades. Elliot, man, thanks for coming on. Thanks so much for having me, guys. Uh, super good to be back here on Altcoin Daily. Big shout out to the Altcoin Daily Army. Uh, and yeah, thanks. You know, one big thing has changed since the last time we had you on multiple months ago. You're now a founder of your own NFT cryptocurrency. How is that? You know, uh, it's funny because I've, in my mind, I've been a founder of this project for years now, but now everybody else knows about it and, uh, and it's much more public. Uh, I would say that it's been a huge, huge change, uh, one that I was prepared for, uh, but I'm super excited it's happening now. And uh, yeah, just I couldn't be more excited about the just the what's going on in NFT land, which I think is going to be probably a big focus of what we're talking about here. But, um, you know, I've been a big believer in the NFT stuff for a long time. And then, you know, sort of feels like the macro environment came along right as we were getting ready to uh, bring super farm to the to the world. And so it's a super exciting time for me. Obviously, as a founder, my day is absolutely <laughs> more busy uh, by about 100x than it was uh, before, uh, focusing more on YouTube. But I'm, I feel very blessed and excited for the journey ahead. For sure. And I want to get real deep into Superform. You're the expert. I, want, I have a lot of questions. But just general big picture, finish this sentence for me. NFTs in 2021 are blank. Just getting noticed. Interesting. I agree. And you have been talking about super farm since before it was the trend. Like you were talking about it way back, at least 2020, maybe before. So can you just give us the, for those people that maybe aren't as familiar or just getting into it, give us the value proposition of super farm and how that relates in the NFT space. Uh, thanks. Yeah, I, I, you know, I was telling you about the early versions of the project in 2019 when we first met uh, in San Francisco. Uh, and at that point, you know, we were focusing on the games that we had been developing more. Uh, and then, you know, Super Farm, as we were coming into DeFi summer, our games were getting uh, closer and closer to completion. Uh, and we were looking at the release strategy and all the behaviors that we wanted for NFTs uh, in a decentralized, like when we were going to introduce the uh, games as NFTs, uh, or so the NFTs in the game. And it became clear that there was uh, a need for some infrastructure that wasn't readily out of the box available on other platforms. And, you know, in a sort of open and decentralized toolkit minded uh, approach, we thought, you know, everything that we would want for our assets, let's make this toolkit very easy for everyone to take advantage of. And so one of those things that became really clear, that would be an interesting uh, thing that you could do with NFTs would be NFT farming. That was validated by DeFi Summer. You know, DeFi Summer really brought forth a lot of interesting tokenomics models, a lot of interesting yield bearing opportunities. And it was clear that NFTs were, in my opinion, being completely overlooked uh, for these particular types of uh, tokenomics and yield bearing opportunities. And to a large degree, I think that they are still being overlooked as to what they really are. Uh, you know, you see, and I kind of, part of me loves this. There is a lot of uh, polarizing opinions, polarized opinions on NFTs. Uh, people tend to uh, have a visceral negative opinion of NFTs when they don't like them or, or an extremely positive uh, uh, opinion. And to me, that really marks a an interesting trend and topic that it can have that polarizing effect. So I think there's a lot of excitement still to come. Um, and Superform itself is really focused on uh, different ways to involve NFTs with DeFi. Uh, and of course, the toolkit that is necessary to get them into uh, video games, uh, like the ones that we're going to be releasing through our partner studio. Cool. So 
I'm familiar, I'm most familiar with like the NFT marketplaces that use Ethereum, like OpenSea, Mintable, Nifty Gateway. Why, but I know there's others, so like Bondly and all those other things, but like why would somebody go through Superfarm when they could easily do it on Mintable or Rarible? Yeah, so, you know, uh, Mintable and Rarible have been out. Uh, they have a really interesting toolkit. Uh, we are paying attention to what everybody's doing in the space. Uh, we're definitely more focused on, on the farming aspect as a differentiator at first, uh, but we're also looking to provide really interesting tools, uh, which for some uh, particular reasons, we don't want to spill all the beans on exactly what tools we'll be rolling out. Uh, but our goal is to maximize the success of those who create uh, and issue NFTs on our platform. Uh, and use the decentralized Superfarm toolkit. And so that's really what we're focused on is, you know, there's a big wave of celebrities, there's a big wave of IP, there's a big wave of people finally realizing the commercial use cases for NFTs, things that I've been really focused on and aware of for several years now. And because of this sort of breakout moment that NFTs are having, the conversations are no longer, hey, an NFT means non-fungible token, and this is what it is. The conversations are more, okay, so here's a good strategy for how your brand and how your, you know, you as an artist or you as a celebrity should uh, be thinking about and, and contextualizing your entry into the space. Um, it's not about if or definitions or education. It's more about how and, uh, you know, strategies on, on the ways to proceed. And so I think that that's a really big step that is, uh, it's necessary for the space and it kind of advances the whole NFT narrative by a few years, in my opinion. Now, when you say NFT farming, uh, can you explain that? Is that providing liquidity and, and what do you get? So, so in the case of Superfarm, you know, a lot of tokens we see have the desire to reward their holders for holding their tokens, but a lot of projects exist uh, and have existed before staking rewards pools were so popular to include. Um, and you see projects like Chainlink now getting their staking program together, you know, so many years into its life cycle and uh, NFTs if done right, uh, can offer some really interesting yield and rewards for holders. And so the goal is to enable any token to very quickly uh, reward its holders with NFTs. And that's the basic mission of Superfarm. Uh, one of its core competencies is any token uh, can be turned into an NFT farm, meaning you can stake that token and earn NFTs. Any token, so like a, just a chain link token, I can stake through uh, Superfarm and earn Chainlink's NFT or whatever, is that what you're saying? Uh, absolutely right. Uh, and we've already announced several high profile partnerships and the long, <laughs> there is a long and robust line of people who want to uh, partner up and use Superfarm's NFT farming technology uh, to do this for their communities because it's a non dilutive reward where you can actually, uh, there's some added benefits of NFTs as well with the artwork and storytelling that you can do with NFTs. Um, you can also uh, engender some really interesting loyalty and excitement from your core community uh, through these assets uh, beyond the, what we really are excited by, which is the utility and the sort of inherent value that you can ascribe to them uh, by programming NFTs to, you know, unlock things within the ecosystem. And we're, we're going to see a lot of that over the coming weeks and months. And that's one of the things that we're most excited to do is instead of just, hey, here's a really cool piece of art. It's, hey, here's a really cool piece of art. It's scarce, it's collectible, but here's what it does. And that's the narrative that I can't wait to see thrive, which is NFT utility. And then we're just at the beginning of that. You know, we're, we're seeing NFTs as collectibles, but we haven't seen the full applications of NFTs as assets yet. And I do want to dis our audience knows this, but I do want to disclose for any new people listening, we are hodlers of Superfarm. Um, you know, we believe in the concept. And let's just take the initial NFTs that have been launching the, these last five days, your first batch, can you talk about the specific utility you get with those NFTs? The first batch of Superfarm NFTs uh, are some of the more important ones in the entire ecosystem. And they're going to have the utility of priority access. Access is something that we see as a huge, huge value prop in crypto land. And people uh, getting into access, whether it's new, uh, in this case, new NFTs through our NFT launchpad um, or in-game assets within video games, uh, which we consider to be one of the biggest use cases. And in our opinion, uh, one of the theses of, of a Superfarm platform is that NFTs within video games 
are going to bring the first billion users to crypto. Uh, and that this community that of 3 billion gamers globally or two and a half billion gamers globally already collect and enjoy and understand digital assets. They spend the money on these digital assets to use them in games. And so they're a perfect community to sort of bring over into the crypto space and say, hey, well, what if you actually own this asset? What if you had more privileges with this asset through true, true ownership? So the first utility is whitelist priority access. So depending on the rarity of the NFT, if it's a legendary, for example, they'll have a 90% chance of getting into what we're calling the priority queue, which you know, each NFT drop that we do, um, once we release the full version of the NFT launchpad, there will be a normal queue and a priority queue. And if you're in the priority queue, that line goes first. And so uh, if somebody w thinks that they want to get access to an NFT drop in the future on Super Farm, then they would want to be in that priority queue to ensure that they can get there early. And so these NFTs, if you're holding the higher rarities, will have a higher percent chance of getting you into that queue. Nothing is 100% guaranteed. Uh, the epics have 50%, the rares have 30%, uh, the uncommons 20 and the commons 10, uh, I believe off, off the top of my head, are the percentage of priority queue access. That's a biggie, and we're really excited for that. Uh, we also have in-game items within games, uh, partner games, that these assets are going to unlock. And so there will be rare digital assets that you can actually play with in real immersive video games. More information on that will be released over time as more games come out and more partner games come out. And then the third utility that we're super excited about is the uh, percent boost multiplier on farming rewards. So if you're holding this kind of like a power up or like a, a rare item within a game, treating the NFT farming ecosystem and gamifying it is something we're super excited for. And that's going to work to allow the holders of these NFTs to get a boost or a multiplier. So if they're staking uh, a, with a legendary, they'll actually get a significant percent boost on their rewards from that farm. Even if it's not the super token farm, for example, if there's a chain link farm or uh, we've announced a polygon farm, we've announced uh, uh, a parsec farm, we've announced an injective farm. And so for our partner farms, there will also be a multiplier that anyone can access if they're holding these NFTs. Interesting. I told you this, uh, you know, off mic, but I, I tried to, you know, get one of the legendary ones the other day, your first series of NFTs for super farm and I couldn't get one. They sold out quick. Yeah, they've been going extremely, extremely fast. So fast so that we actually adjusted the format to be a whitelist lottery. So it was a little less of a, of a rush here. Um, and this was uh, to make things as fair as possible. And we just announced that a couple of minutes ago. Here's my question. Um, so I understand like the utility of these first ones that you're releasing. It seems you get a lot of utility and value for the super farm ecosystem. So like I can understand why somebody would, would want those, but maybe ones that you release for super farm down the line you know, I'm trying to think what would be better, just holding the super farm tokens, which are fungible and there's a market value, or like actually getting one of these NFTs. What if that's not, what if holding tokens is better? What do you think about that? Yeah, you know, I guess if you're asking like which one's a better investment, I can't really speak uh, to those kinds of that's things. That's why I didn't use as, the I word. I didn't, I didn't say the investment word because I wanted you to answer it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I, I mean, in the end, the, the market will decide what's the most valuable. And uh, the, the drops that come through the platform, uh, if people really value those, then they, they may uh, choose to value the NFTs more. Again, I can't predict market forces. Uh, however, our goal uh, as a platform is to uh, just create the best products that we can, uh, whether it's through the toolkit or whether it's through the actual NFTs that are released from the platform. So that's the goal uh, that we bring to everything. Uh, as far as partner NFT releases uh, that come through the launch pad, uh, you know, the goal is to provide strategy and support whenever asked, uh, eventually decentralizing this toolkit so much so, so that, you know, it's not up to us who comes through the launch pad, uh, but up to the decentralized community. Um, but, you know, whenever we can, for people who are asking, uh, we try to help them understand how they can imbue their own NFTs with the most utility, access, uh, long-term sustainability. These are the things that we're very interested in. There's a lot of high-profile 
people circling the space right now and they're all really in a data gathering phase. They really want to understand how their brands, how their businesses, how their followings, how they can most benefit from this in a real sustainable and beneficial way. And there's quite a few people that are sensitive to not be seen as sort of chasing a hype. And so that's definitely uh, something where I'm having these conversations many times throughout the day of trying to help uh, people understand where I see NFTs going in the next five years, 10 years. Uh, there's a lot of people who uh, ask the question, hey, is this bubble about to burst? Is this a, is this a bubble we're in with NFTs? Um, and you know, I always respond pretty much with the same response, which is that I'm not really focused on where NFTs are going to be in 30 days. I'm focused on where NFTs are going to be in five, 10 years. And that's really what we've taken to this project since you guys first met me really in 2019. We started building in 2018 towards this concept. And I think that when you think of things like that, it becomes a little less of a, uh, it, comes, it comes a little less volatile, the mindset. It's, it's a little bit more sustainable. And, and you start to see, just like you guys would investing in cryptocurrencies, you know, something might do well in a short period of time and something else might do poorly on a short period of time. But if you're thinking long-term enough, uh, you end up getting the right results. Interesting. So people who um, go through Super Farm to deploy NFTs, they have to be approved by you guys and they have to work with you for utility. Is that correct? No, not at all. It's a decentralized platform and toolkit. Uh, however, we're getting a lot of inbound requests and people who are contacting pretty much me personally because I'm so visible and public and vocal about NFTs asking for advice, saying, hey, how should they structure things or advice on how they should structure their own NFT collections. And so I'm kind of uh, helping people understand the way I see the, the marketplace. Um, but in the end, Superfarm is a decentralized toolkit. Uh, and and that's the, it, it will be completely permissionless, open, and people can choose to use it in whichever ways they see fit. But I can't go right now and like I can at like a, a Mintable and make an NFT, or, or can I? Soon you will be. Yeah, soon you will be. We're, gonna, we're opening those features up so, uh, iteration by iteration. Um, talk to me about what sort of utility, let's just say hypothetically, I have no clue the celebrity is circling the space, although I can guess, like a famous comedian, is he interest, like wants to launch his own NFTs about his own stuff? Is he interested in getting, you know, uh, interoperability with a video game or whitelist access? Like specifically for those type of celebrities, what is the utility for them? Yeah, so I think you have to segment um, the different types of NFTs, just like we would segment uh, a car from a CD, from a movie, from a video game purchase, uh, and understand that NFT is a generic wrapper uh, for, for property. It's very generic wrapper, uh, but it's programmable. And there's a lot of really interesting things you can do with it. Uh, and so understanding for the different use cases, different types of artists, creators, and brands should and will be using these things in very different ways. Now, I'm a big believer that comedy is a fantastic fit for NFT, uh, mainly because the monetization streams for comedians are extremely limited. You know, you pretty much have a three options. You go to SNL, you get a comedy special uh, on Netflix, uh, or maybe you have a really big social media account and you make sort of money off of that. Uh, start a podcast. Tips. Yeah, start, start, start a podcast. There you go. That's the other one. Uh, and so that those monetization streams are inherently really hard to access for, for the majority. Whereas someone might be really funny and some of the content they create might have a ton of value to the audience. Um, and I think it's really interesting to start seeing the NFT as a way to maybe monetize uh, short, you know, different types of content directly to, uh, directly to the fans. And so you end up with a model where your top 1% or 0.1% uh, depending how big you are, 0.0001% of fans actually get to show what they value this rare content at. And that revenue is most likely, as we're seeing, going to be greater than a small sort of uh, uh, you know, mass uh, spread uh, piece of content where you know, each person is only giving a very tiny amount of monetization to the artist. And so I'm really excited for those particular uh, types of art forms, including comedy and others, to start making their way on the blockchain. Uh, and I think that what you'll see is at first a lot of experimentation, but over time, we'll know the, the ways that comedians will see the best way to release these. And how are you, um, 
How, how do celebrities know about Super Farm? Do you have a dedicated person reaching out to them or how's that work? We've actually done uh, zero reach out on uh, Super Farm side. Uh, to be quite honest, I did not see the celebrity conversations happening this early. Uh, we did not optimize our team for reach outs to celebs, uh, but the mania, if you will, around NFTs has led to people really just looking for experts and guidance in the space. Uh, you know, when you hear about a, a Blau or a Beeple release making 11.7 .7 or $69 million respectively, it catches a lot of uh, eyeballs and people become really interested. Uh, and I've obviously been talking about NFTs for a very long time, enough so that some really, really impressive folks that are people I've looked up to in the business or entertainment world for a very long time started organically following and reaching out to me, uh, including a lot of talent managers and interesting folks like that. And so uh, it, was, it was completely organic, but I just started getting DMs. <laughs> Is that, do you think, from your YouTube channel, because you've always been passionately speaking about this, or is it through, um, I don't know, just people you've met in the industry, somebody recommending you? Uh, yeah, I think it's a, all of the above, right? It's just sort of, you know, there's not that many people out there saying, hey, I... I believe in this. This is something I know is going to take over. I, I have a vision for the future of NFTs. It's just not that big of a world, right? And so, you know, if you're going to go down a list of the top 50 people or 20 people, uh, I just, I, I assume based on my history as a content creator and uh, the people who maybe if they asked one person, then they referred them to me type thing. I'm not sure the exact uh a ping pong result for everybody, but I've been pretty surprised to hear about the people who said in the first meetings that they just actually just watched the channel. And I'm sure you'd be surprised if you knew who watched your channel. Dude, I'm constantly surprised that even my friends from college say they watch the channel. Like Everybody watches Altcoin Daily. Like and subscribe, everybody. Hell yeah. And Elio Trades. Um, and that, you know, I want to piggyback off of that because it seems to me like the peop there's a large portion of people that like NFTs because of the revolution, especially with artists, that they can get recurring payment if it's resold and stuff but there's also a large amount of speculators in the space. They're the ones buying. But it seems like the celebrities and the athletes are the real people that are making money. What piece of advice would you give to the average person that is interested in jumping into this space, but they're only seeing the celebs make the money? Yeah, I think I, think I disagree with that. I think the data disagrees with that. Uh, it seems, based on the news, as if this is a celebrity-driven experiment. But if you go and you go on OpenSea and you see and you sort by recent sales, what you'll find is that these collectible ecosystems and other experiments are having way more volume than any celebrity or influencer NFT drop so far. And so I believe that it's pretty clear that the NFT is for the little guy, for the newbie, for the non-established person, a much more sustainable, interesting path to follow than trying to become a celebrity and the other way around, right? Uh, and the celeb drops are, for the most part, having limited legs because they're being done with limited knowledge. And so uh, maybe, and I'm hoping in the, the coming days and weeks, you'll see a fusion between IP and crypto savvy. And that's sort of, these are the conversations that we're having and NFT savvy to be specific. Um, but what you're seeing a significant amount of right now uh, is just creative people who are playing with economics, utility, collectible, art, and they're creating incredible results. That doesn't mean everybody is, most people aren't, but you see a tremendous amount of success stories. And you know, I have a lot of conversations with managers and uh, interesting folks who say to me, hey, I've got, you know, we're, we'll be talking about maybe a, a more well-known person, and then they'll follow up and say, well, I actually have a new artist, I actually have a new client. Do you think NFTs would work for them? And my response is always the exact same, which is if I was an aspiring insert, you know, comedian, musician, artist, I would be focusing 0% on the old system, 100% on the new system. Because this is a system where if you have 1,000 or 100 true fans, they can directly support your art and your creativity with no censorship, no, no middlemen, uh, no uh, gatekeepers. You can literally build an audience of 100 to 1,000 people and forever support yourself within your creative field. And the more, the earlier you dive in and the faster you build your reputation here in NFT land, 
the higher the ceiling is for you before the masses come. And you see this with everything, with new social media platforms, you see this with new trends in society. And I think there's no better example of this than Beeple, who is now the third richest living artist in the world. Uh, and a year ago, it would have been very hard to identify, you know, for most people, Beeple and much respect to Beeple. I just think that it's an amazing story. Uh, I just had a quick question. Um, so once you get your um, NFT marketplace to compete with Mintable and OpenSea, once that gets rolled out, you guys get a little bit farther along, what's going to make somebody choose to uh, go over to Super Farm rather than a Mintable? Is it, is it going to be the celebrities who, who, who do it? Um, what, what do you think? Yeah, you know, a part of this, I'll, I'll say, you know, in more generic terms, uh, you know, we have a belief that the celebrity thing is going to happen. And, you know, I know based on the conversations I'm having uh, and what I see going around is that the celebrity thing will become very commonplace to the point where it is not a motivator or a driver of too much reaction uh, in crypto land. Um, however, you know, building, uh, building a community, uh, which has been the core focus of uh, me and and people like yourself and other uh, colleagues and collaborators of the pl of the platform. This has been a huge uh, feature of the platform is that the community for Superfarm is incredibly robust and strong. Uh, and then you know in the end it comes down to the decentralized toolkit. Um, if the toolkit is better, then people will flock to the toolkit. And so the the concept is what are the tools uh, that would make this better? And that's our mindset is just creating the best tools uh, and that by creating the best tools and having great discoverability uh, that we will end up uh, or that Superfarm will end up attracting uh, the best creators. And, and, and that's the, the cycle that uh, is the core focus. And we don't believe that it's going to be uh, necessarily a celebrity driven uh, phenomenon that's getting a lot of the headlines right now. Um, but it's just sort of a, a tip of the iceberg type thing uh, where the real NFT culture is just getting started. And in the end, people will go, you know, sort of to use a, a easier metaphor, TikTok is so popular because it's so easy to create high quality content with VFX formats, audio effects, uh, and trends and, and challenges and the way that things are kind of uh, made cookie cutter for you through their toolkit, uh, just like with Snapchat and their filters that really attracted a lot of usage uh, back in the day. And I think it's going to be the exact same thing for NFTs, which is that the better tools will attract the better creators, which will attract the bigger audiences. And so the super farm toolkit is going to be more complex than like um, a mintable or open sea where literally you just have to upload, like you're going to be able to do different things. Uh, well, you know, I'm sure that everyone will be evolving what they provide that are communities over time. Uh, we have several features that we're excited to roll out uh, that are, that are uh, on the sort of short to midterm ro roadmap. And I'm sure as we get to, you know, future stages, uh, we'll be excited to add, add even more and different ones. Just like you've seen, there's not really a, a moment in time that stops for content creation. Uh, and we see this uh, in, a, in a certain sense, kind of like content creation in a digital realm, in a, in a crypto realm. Um, and so, you know, the, the mindset is very much to uh, be thinking about the toolkits uh, that people need now, uh, tomorrow, and the next day. And so uh, to answer your question in short, yeah, we want to have more robust tools than simply here's a uh, one click or, a, or no code experience. No code is just a, a starting point. When you look at top uh, gaming slash NFT altcoin engine, do you think, man, dead man walking? Uh, no, absolutely not. And, <laughs> and, uh, and I don't really, that's, that's, I don't see crypto as a zero sum game ever. Wait, why uh, do you often say that? I don't understand why. Uh, well, they're he's both. Trying to, he's trying to be some, he's trying to be spicy. He's trying yeah. to get some tea spilled here. <laughs> trying he to be spicy. Headline. <laughs> but also they are the top player. They're one of the top players in the space. They've been around a lot longer, relatively speaking. And it appears that Superfarm is tackling, you know, many of the same utilities only in a lot of cases, you know, on steroids version. So I just wanted his opinion. So I appreciate your, uh, that reading of the situation, uh, flattering. Uh, and to me, it's, it's one of those things where engine is part of the inspiration for what we've done. 
We think that Engine did a great job uh, in, in so many regards. And we also see one of the biggest sort of gaps there between uh, wh where we are right now and where we want the industry to go as having a lot to do with end use cases. Uh, now with NFT mania, it's a lot easier to get end use cases sort of put through the funnel. Um, but you know, in the end, we started with games before we started building infrastructure. Um, and I think that's pretty interesting and a unique uh, facet of uh, how the team uh, believed the order of operations should go. Um, and so the decentralized toolkit came uh, after the concept of, you know, we want to make sure that this isn't a, a, a infrastructure that that potentially doesn't uh, get as much usage as, as we would want it to get. And so we wanted to build, uh, we, were, we wanted to solve for that first. And so that's one of the things that I think uh, is a unique order of operations that you don't see a lot in crypto. Um, as well, you know, in the end, uh, we see this kind of like the DeFi thing. Uh, and I'll explain what that means, which is there's a, a group of DeFi VCs and founders that understood that the more money gets locked in DeFi, and the more that there were more protocols locking even more money in DeFi, that it would create an exponential and compounding effect that would bring even more money into DeFi. And that this isn't about uh, one protocol versus another with NFTs, but it's about understanding that we see 8 billion almost uh, people in the world that are not NFT holders, that do not know about NFTs, and that the more NFT projects succeed at all, the more that this community will grow and the more that success will be had by the NFT industry as a whole. So we see uh, a compounding and, and beneficial and synergistic relationship between NFT platforms as of right now. If I buy something on OpenSea and I have a fantastic experience with my NFT, and then I go, I, I'm not going to say to myself, well, now I'm definitely not going to go buy on Superfarm or now I'm definitely not going to go buy on Engine. That's not the mindset, right? The mindset is NFTs, good, cool. And so that opens the door for everybody. And I think that, that most people in the NFT industry see the other projects as collaborative. Now, it's, uh, it's fun to be uh, you know, an altcoin founder in a bull market. But once this bear market hits, all through it, are you going to be with the project? Are you more of a Charles Hoskinson or a Dan Larimer? Oh, <laughs> um, I, I don't know if I'd call myself a Charles Hoskinson, uh, but you know, this project, I mean, as you guys well know, um, I was building obsessively during the last bear market when there was absolutely no hype and no FOMO and uh, uh, funding was very, very, very uh, sparse in the industry uh, and it was out of pure passion. Uh, and so all of this sort of excitement to me is uh, really nice, but it's not taken for granted uh, because, you know, you and I and uh, my team have been through the hard, hard times with this stuff. Uh, and so, you know, what it makes me excited for is the longevity of the ecosystem, knowing that uh, the opportunity to uh, grow an ecosystem over a long period of time will be there. Uh, and that's for me, uh, the ultimate reward is, is the journey and the building part and uh, the delivering products that people touch. Uh, the, the project itself started with a very simple thought process, which is it's 2018, September or August-ish. And the question is, what is a product that people would use while Bitcoin is crashing and crypto is crashing? And you know, we came down to three, you know, we did a SWAT which is a, uh, a strengths, weaknesses, uh, opportunities, and threats. And you, you go through the list and you, you sort of put those out for all the different product verticals we could come up with. And we came up with three different product verticals that we thought were past a significant SWOT analysis for a bear market. And they were exchanges, gambling, and video games. Now, exchanges have really big regulatory hurdles, uh, liquidity issues. You need a lot of money to start an exchange. There was also a lot of you know, really established players. We didn't feel like we had an edge on how to innovate there. Uh, as far as uh, gambling, we saw pretty much almost every casino accepts crypto. Uh, and there, while there are still room for improvements and iterations in gambling, it's not really something that appealed to us. And so we kind of put that one aside. Uh, and it was very clear to us, myself as a gamer, my partner is a lifelong gamer, uh, we buy stuff in video games all the time. And so to me, it was a very natural, uh, something that came from a, a place of passion and personal interest, knowing that, hey, if there were games with NFTs in it and the games were fun and really made you want to play, 
then people would care about these assets and have it would have nothing to do with Bitcoin. And so that was kind of how we started the project. And while it's still untested, that's the thesis is that gaming at a high enough level with NFTs uh, would hopefully, at least to a significant degree, decouple from the cycles. Do, uh, real quick question. Do you have a hard out in 20 minutes or could you go five or 10 minutes over? Just want to get a gauge. Um, Dude, we need you. This is a great conversation. What do yeah, you this is great. <laughs> um, yeah, I can, I can go 10 minutes over. Let me just text uh, my next meeting. Nice. Still a man of the people. I love that. <laughs> By the way, dude, the fact that you were a plant in late 2018, it was hard enough to convince people that Bitcoin had a future. Props to you for thinking even beyond that uh, because, you know, the sentiment was very low at that time. Yeah, you know, I'm a, I'm a believer. And, and for me, I've been building apps, websites, and games, uh, working insane hours uh, to get them uh, functional and investment and community. And when I discovered crypto in 2017, or at least when I really discovered it, uh, it was clear to me that without a doubt, this is where the next innovations will come from. Um, and then, you know, for me as a builder, it's always... Uh, the question of in tech, which is where, where is this going next and how can you be there first? Because that's kind of how the tech industry works is if you can predict the next turn of, you know, consumer behavior of technology interaction with the world, then, then that's the real challenge. Um, and then, you know, you've seen just first movers benefit tremendously. And so uh, we recognize that NFT and games uh, in 2018, that was really, uh, for some reason, it just became super obvious. It, it became almost like a, uh, like a haunting reality that I just would wake up every day and just be driven by is that this is the future. And, and it was no way to, to avoid it is, is this is just so obvious to me. Once you see it, you can't unsee it type thing. <laughs> All right. I think we had a little bit of blip in the video recording there, but let me ask you a question, Elliot. I feel like a big differentiator with um, Super Farm is that because a lot of these, just generally, these altcoin projects, they you know list themselves on Uniswap. There's obviously a risk factor there, and you guys are listed on Uniswap. But also, Binance, the biggest exchange in the world, uh, also supports uh, Super Farm. Uh, I think that's pretty cool. Can you explain how that came about and your relationship there? I, I think that's a big differentiator. What do you think? Yeah, you know, uh, it's it's flattering. Uh, you know, obviously they do their due diligence, um, and it was flattering uh, to see their interest in the due diligence process, uh, to see them interested in the token. I think a lot of uh, founders uh, think about that journey and whether big exchanges will be interested in their token. Um, quite frankly, we're so preoccupied, and our our goals are almost entirely focused on uh, the the product and uh, making sure that uh, we are doing everything we can to push forward the toolkit. Uh, obviously, we have a big community and an excited community. And uh, I, you know, it, it was one of those things where uh, at this early stage, we're, we're, we're nothing but flattered by this. But, uh, but obviously, it only, uh, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting news uh, piece, but uh, it's just that. And uh, it doesn't change any of our uh, short, short or midterm goals. Aaron and I want to end with a big picture cryptocurrency in general type questions. Before we do that, we do have a couple more uh, zoning in on Super Farm. And one thing that I like that you said is that it's not a zero sum game. Projects that have value um, can work together, can benefit off of each other. And you have a strategic partnership or Super Farm with Eternity. What value do they bring to Super Farm and why are you bullish on that project in general? Uh, well, you know, Eternity uh, has been way out ahead of everyone else in getting uh, high profile uh, folks, uh, specifically celebrities, uh, to join the NFT movement. And I guess, you know, I've sort of hinted at this, but they have some really big names uh, attached to this project, uh, household type names. Uh, and I think it does just so much for the NFT movement to have those kinds of names attached with cryptocurrency and NFTs. And it brings the understanding and the familiarity with the space uh, forward by years, right? To have those kinds of partnerships. Uh, now, like I said with you guys, Super Farm has done zero to reach out to these people, though we have had quite a bit of inbound. Uh, that was not really a goal of the project. 
Uh, but we have been building, like I said, really interesting tools. Uh, and so obviously the partnership with Athernity is, goal, is really geared at helping them maximize their success uh, with the uh, people that they've already recruited. And of course, doing some collaborative stuff, bringing some of their big names uh, to Superfarm as well. And so that's kind of the, uh, the synergistic approach. And I think that of, all, you know, of the many, many projects in the space, uh, Eternity is a great example of how two NFT projects can be extremely synergistic. But you, what, but I just want to follow up. What is like, why do they need you and why do you need them? If you could just like lay it out for me, is it? Yeah. What, I mean, I think need might not be the right word. Like they're a very capable team and we're a capable team. And, you know, is it possible? Like I said, we have celebrities in our uh, pipeline and they have tech. Uh, folks and they have great engineers um, and it's more about how can uh, we uh, help each other maximize success you know and and have even better events uh, by working together and collaborating and I think it's uh, it's you know not not necessarily like hey they would not be able to do something or we would not be able to do something without each other but is there a benefit in working together to accomplish x y or z and i think that the answer to that is yes and so that was why we chose to partner with them um, and it, I think it's the same for a lot of crypto projects. Uh, for example, we have Parsec. Uh, could we build some monitoring tools uh, like they have built? Sure, it's possible. Is it beneficial for us to use the ones they've already built? Absolutely. And, uh, and I think that that's sort of how you see uh, these partnerships working is, you know, why are we reinventing the wheel when there's a fantastic partner available to help us accomplish X, Y, or Z? Um, and each partnership is unique, right? Like, whereas one might be a tech integration, others might be, you know, uh, co-promotion events or, or creation of, uh, you know, co-branded events and co-branded uh, NFT collectibles or series or uh, initiatives. And so I think that there is uh, a lot of value in seeing, just like I said, the space grow. The, go the goal is to see the space grow. Uh, and if I can help uh, Eternity or Eternity can help Superfarm, um, uh, I guess if Superfarm can help Eternity or Eternity can help Superfarm, I think it's a net benefit to everybody. My final question before we get to a couple big picture questions is, um, I mean, I guess thinking the brand name with this is Ikami, Ami. Um, how important is licensing? That seems like something that these NFT projects should be cornering because they already have like built in people who want to collect that stuff. Is, is licensing, do you think that's important? Absolutely. Fantastic. Uh, however, I also think that it comes down to, in the end, uh, structuring collectibles and that what you're going to see is while existing IP and a lot of this IP, if you dig into their history, started as physical collectibles. You know, if you look at like mutant ninja Tur Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and other types of stuff. Uh, and so what you'll see is that uh, regardless of where the IP starts, whether it's original or it's licensed, uh, you know, for example, like the amazing brands that Ecomi has managed uh, to get their hands on, uh, that's definitely going to be a revenue stream. It's going to have a huge commercial application. Um, you know, in the end, my focus is not as heavily on licensing. You know, we did partner with Animoca Brands, which in my opinion is one of the most talented licensors in the entire space and a huge, huge supporter of what, we do, what we're doing. And we have a lot of exclusive partnership stuff we'll be doing, which we'll be rolling out. They have several brands, uh, one called Limpo, which is tokenizing sports heroes. They have one called uh, Quid, which actually has the rights to Marvel, Disney, Dr. Seuss, uh, uh, and several other, Rick and Morty, several other big uh, pieces of IP. I think the structure, of these things because most of this IP is not exclusively licensed. The structure of the collectible is, is in my opinion, the key, right? And, and fi figuring out how to elevate that and how to give tools for NFT creators to be elevating what they create and the way they create it, the way they introduce it. That to me is my focus, uh, but there's no doubt that licensing is going to be huge and a big congrats to Ikomi for pushing that forward and Alfred Kahn is a legend in that regard. And final big picture NFT question, uh, with the setup, it would have been so hard in 2010 and 2011 for people to predict what Bitcoin in the cryptocurrency space would be 10 years down the line. So keeping that in mind, how, how do you see NFTs being different or the same or, or growing 10 years down the line? So to me, and I believe this for quite some time, that NFT is the most uh, is it's the onboarding mechanism and it is the most commercially applicable uh, vehicle within the crypto world. Now, of course, 
I do believe that crypto will take over so many things and money itself and everything like that. Uh, however, for a consumer facing product, uh, what we're seeing is that the NFT can span and hit the broadest audience through gaming, through celebrities, through uh, branded IP, through collectibles, uh, through content itself. Uh, and then you have things like DeFi, which hit the deepest audiences, where the advantage to someone, the more money they have, you know, the trillion dollar asset managers moving into DeFi is 100,000 million times more than your average user because they have so much more money. And so I think that when you see NFT, you see it as the most sort of widespread commercial application in some, in some regards for crypto itself. Uh, and I do believe that, you know, if you're fast forwarding in 10, 20 years, the sort of concepts that we saw outlined in Ready Player One or the Oasis and things like that, those are definitely, you know, things that are not lost uh, upon the NFT community that this is, in my opinion, where things are going is that thing, the crossover between digital and physical possessions, digital and physical ownership, those things will continue to merge. Uh, and uh, the importance of NFT, I believe, is, is just beginning. Uh, and while it might be in a bit of a rush or a first period of just getting noticed, if you fast forward 10 years, it'll be insulting and scammy if there's not an NFT attached. Interesting. Interesting. Anything more on Superform before we ask you about Bitcoin, Ethereum, and that stuff? Uh, no, just a big thank you to the Superfarm community. Uh, super humbled that we're at this stage uh, right now. And, you know, we're very, very excited for the next steps. Cool. Elliot, let's cut the crap, get down to brass tacks. It is clear more than ever that Ethereum is bullish in 2021. As we see more people onboarding on the network to DeFi, to NFTs. And I'm sure we asked you this back in 2020. But now that we're months into this and we have more data points, could you give us the bull case for Ethereum in 2021 and how you see it playing out at the end of the year? Uh, yeah, and thank you for, the, for that uh, tee up because we have had this conversation uh, a couple of times. Uh, the thing about Ethereum is in 2017, this was exactly what was happening, which is tons of people were flooding in. Ethereum was extremely congested and expensive. And the narrative that this just simply was going to die out was all inclusive and, and everybody uh, was believing that the ETH killer movement was going to be the future. And let me just be clear, there will absolutely be other chains, collaborative chains, other layer ones that have tremendous value and utility like Binance Smart Chain, uh, like Matic Polygon, like Polkadot, like uh, Cardano. However, the reality is just like what we saw with Bitcoin, how there were so many coins that were cheaper and faster and better to create and deploy uh, a financial mechanism or transfer uh, stores of value. The fact is that Ethereum has the trust. It has the trust of a really, really big uh, network and the most important applications and the highest value applications are finding their home on Ethereum because it is trustworthy and it is secure. So when you're storing, for example, a video game character, well, maybe, just maybe that should be done on a cheaper chain, on a faster chain uh, to improve the user experience. But if I'm storing the deed to my house, or an insurance policy for my life insurance, or maybe a significant access key for a, you know, a pension fund worth you know, billions or trillions of dollars, then I would really seek out the absolute highest standard of security and trustworthiness. And this is where you see the difference of the slower moving, more valuable ecosystems uh, long-term versus the faster moving, uh, more experimental and newer ecosystems uh, that would require maybe higher throughput. And so what you'll see is trade-offs, uh, but Ethereum's case uh, for being the absolute undisputed home of very high value, important smart contract functions, I believe will continue to hold value. And for that reason, this is the sort of difference between a very broad approach, a very broad appeal versus a very deep appeal, where the people who are moving huge, insanely big, hard to comprehend big sums of money are doing it on Ethereum and that $100 gas fee means nothing to them. Whereas the people who are looking for maybe a super clean user-friendly experience that would ap ap appeal to the TikTok generation, now maybe that's going to take root on a different chain and most likely it will. Now what I like about what's happening is that the ETH killer movement has moved to the ETH scalar movement. 
And you're seeing that these chains like Polkadot uh, and even Cardano now, Binance Smart Chain, Polygon, the focus isn't on stealing from ETH, but it's on offloading from ETH. And I think that that's going to be a big, big a characteristic of why 2021 is slightly different than 2017, though based on Twitter comments, YouTube comments, it feels as though people are once again writing ETH off uh, as essentially old news. And as people who have been through this cycle before, I think it's pretty easy to have some perspective on it. For those people who are new to it, I would just say, look, there's going to be amazing value in those chains. There's going to be amazing value capture across all valuable layer ones. There's also going to be insane utility and time-tested, battle-tested, incredible value that comes from Ethereum. So how like, do you think uh, 5,000 ETH near the cycle top, maybe end of the year, $10,000 ETH? How do you think about it? Uh, well, you know, it really depends on how far Bitcoin goes. But if Bitcoin reaches the several hundred thousand dollar mark, the sort of uh, 250K plus range, I think that puts Ethereum um, at a $20,000 to $50,000 price point. Uh, you're looking at what happened last time. Uh, Ethereum topped, you know, it's just for easy math, Ethereum topped last time at about a 1440. Uh, and Bitcoin's top before that cycle was at about 1160. Uh, now, if Bitcoin, you know, if obviously Ethereum has a different, you know, tokenomics, they have more, more supply. Um, but, you know, in the end, I think Ethereum has the gas to go to over 20K uh, in, if this bull run continues like we think we're going to. Um, and I think there's even a possibility that it makes a sort of pretty astronomical blow off top run uh, to something above 50K. I've said as high as 87. I mean, it, that number comes from dividing the market cap of gold. Uh, I think you guys covered this as well. Uh, the market cap of gold uh, and sort of giving that to Ethereum and saying, well, is Ethereum and what it provides to the world, is it as valuable as decentralized gold? And I think this was a quote from uh, Tyler Winklevoss, which is, it has to be at least that value. You know, the, a decentralized operating system that's secure and global and, and, uh, and can actually um, sort of divorce us from typical systems of finance and power and, and ownership. I think that there's a huge case that over time we could reach uh, that system being worth as much as decentralized gold. Uh, and I think that those numbers point to, you know, some pretty astronomical targets. So whether it's this cycle or next or whatever, I think ETH has plenty of gas to reach a healthy five figures. 50 to 80K ETH. You make Raul Paul look like Charlie Munger. But to be fair, on this cycle, I think 20 uh, is where if I had to say, hey, this is where I would say for sure, uh, if we have this cycle, I think it would hit. But, you know, there, things at, at those stages of the bull run get really parabolic. And whether it stays there or not, I mean, you look at ETH's path to 1400 and then back. Uh, and you see it was a very, very short moment, but it did go from just a few hundred bucks up to 1400 and back very fast. And I think you could see that where it goes up from maybe 10,000 or 15,000 and then makes this insane explosion up and then right back down again. <laughs> and that's what would be like the, the blow off top, you know, long term, you know, 10 years down the line, 20 years down the line, I think looking at, you know, ETH being worth, you know, 50 plus thousand dollars is, is something I'm comfortable with saying. For sure. And in our final eight, 12 minutes, whatever we have, you touched on this a little bit, but I want to dig a little deeper. What is the future for Polkadot and Cardano in your eyes, in the sense, are we just going to watch them compete for market share for the next five, 10 years with Ethereum, provide infrastructure? How do you see it? First and foremost, competition is fantastic. Fantastic for, for innovation. Second of all, I think what you're going to see and what we need to see is interoperability really explode and take center stage. The way the internet works is not a bunch of data silos. You have every single data center talks to every other data center. And that's how it needs to happen with blockchain if we're going to have really the future of the financial networks. That's something that Polkadot um, with their sort of parachain systems is really pushing forward. Um, and obviously Cardano has their own approach to interoperability. Uh, what I'd like to see is you know, who's the best at interoperating. And I think that that will be a big advantage. And so that's kind of where I'm looking at differentiators. Um, but Cardano doing something better uh, and then Polkadot or ETH or, or any kind of combination of those words is all bullish for the space, right? Because we have more value creation and more uh, essential fundamental toolkits that are being created uh, here in the decentralized world. So I think people misunderstand uh, how, you know, 
every coin having some kind of breakout innovation is really good for every other coin. Uh, and that the, the need to be tribal and say, I like this project and so that project must be bad. I think it's, it just fundamentally misunderstands the way crypto grows. Uh, look, look at crypto itself. When Bitcoin grows, so does Ethereum. When Ethereum grows, so does altcoins and the market caps balloon. It's not like they eat away from each other. Well, let's talk about Bitcoin because, you know, it's always fun to speculate on altcoins and, you know, Bitcoin, it just seems like a sure thing at this point to me. And I think a lot of people, so, you know, sometimes, you know, cause we talked about it so much, we don't talk about it every time, but what do you think, man? I mean, it seems to me like this is the first cycle where people realize that Bitcoin isn't going away. How high do you think Bitcoin could go this cycle? And, and what are your thoughts in general? So I think that uh, Bitcoin's fantastic uh, and it's being really validated by, I mean, you can't really overstate how important the Tesla move was. I think that that is a zero to one moment. Uh, Tesla, Elon, uh, what that represents in the scheme of modern business, financial innovation, uh, that is a huge, huge move. Now, I don't think we go backwards from there. I think we go forwards. And so I would be incredibly shocked to see a Bitcoin under that Thirty-three thousand uh, dollar range ever again, ever again. Um, I also think that the Michael—I mean, you got to give a lot of credit to Michael Saylor in being a thought leader on this as well. Kind of funny how it all lines up with the four-year cycle. But that said, uh, it's just one of those things where uh, Bitcoin is too big to fail. Uh, it is being gradually added as a reserve asset to a lot of balance sheets, and as the infrastructure evolves, and hopefully we get a Bitcoin ETF, it is. Uh, zero doubt in my mind that it will come to replace the gold hedge in a lot of people's portfolios. Uh, and of course, with its increased functionality, it's zero doubt in my mind that it will eventually come to be bigger than gold. And so to me, it's, it's a matter of time. These things aren't going to happen overnight, but the next chapter is really the big money bags getting involved and uh, people kind of treating it like a long-term savings account, uh, which is already happening in certain degrees, but that trend will just continue. Um, and again, this is just super bullish because it creates a liquidity floor in crypto where all that Bitcoin is now being wrapped and deployed in other ecosystems. And it just creates more capital to be deployed in the ecosystem. You know, the, the bigger Bitcoin is, the better it is for every coin on the block. And how do you see, you mentioned ETFs. I mean, I personally think it's, you know, they're going to happen in the US by the end of this year. We're seeing every other major country, you know, get involved, Canada, Brazil, but for Bitcoin and crypto in general, how do you see the end of this year playing out? Just kind of, you know, BSing, talking, is it going to be the exact same as 2017? What do you think? Is there going to be a bear market? Uh, until proven otherwise, I'm operating as if there will be. Uh, if I'm proven otherwise, then, you know, happy days, right? Uh, there's nothing to complain about. Uh, there's a, there's a non-zero chance, uh, probably around a 10 to 20% chance that this cycle based on stimulus and money printing and all these things just continues to grow. And Bitcoin just kind of works its way up over time, over and over and over again, because uh, the amount of people who get in just keeps growing and the demand keeps growing and the amount of people losing faith in traditional monetary value keeps growing, which is really the first cycle we've had where there's a real, a real question as to like, hey, what is the US dollar really worth? That wasn't really in, in the discussions. That was just a purely, yeah, okay, okay, okay. You know, you're like, yeah, okay, maybe. And then, but, but for the most part, those people who believe that were on the extremes. Whereas now I feel like the amount of people who have a question about money printing and inflation are more, you know, center middle. And, uh, and I think that you don't have to be that extreme to say, hey, this is a lot of money printing. Um, and I think that what you'll see here is that there's a, 10 to 20% chance that we have no more bear market, uh, or at least for the next five so years, we don't have a bear market. Um, but I'm operating on a belief that at some point in 2021, Bitcoin will go extremely parabolic and, uh, and then the altcoins will, it'll sort of do what it did in 2017, go parabolic, have a big collapse where people realize, hey, party's over, altcoins go absolutely insane. Uh, and, then, uh, and then the pain begins. <laughs> uh, but, but to be fair, and I'll caveat, DeFi changes the bear market significantly because people now have the ability to earn yield and put their assets to work. So now holding stable coins and locking them in protocols to earn yield is something that wasn't around in the, in the last bear market. You just weren't seeing that kind of yield and reliable yield. So that liquidity that's in crypto, I believe, is not going to leave crypto like it did last time, just saying, hey, 
party's over, I'm going back to fiat, uh, and I'll see what happens next time. It's going to say, hey, party's over, I'm going into stable coins, and I'm going into Anchor Protocol or Yearn Finance or you know a couple of the other really uh, generous yield farming protocols or even a new one, which creates, of course, still a ton of growth and dynamic uh, changes within the ecosystem, which can have a lot of opportunity attached. So if you're paying attention to DeFi, and of course, what I believe is NFTs who have, with consumer use cases, there's still going to be a ton of momentum versus last bull run. So that's how I see it is Bitcoin will continue to go on its cyclical, uh, you know, valuation jumps governed pretty much by the having, And then you'll see the altcoins uh, have interesting reactions in response to that. But I do believe bear markets are forever changed. Very interesting. I love the perspective. Final question. And Elliot, truly, I only want you to answer this if you are comfortable, have something to say, and also take Superform out of it. But as a newer person coming into the NFT space today, how would you, how would you personally, how would you personally invest $1,000 NFT audition, addition? Uh, how would you do it? Uh, picks, picks and shovels, right? Uh, there is a very, very significant chance that any single collectible series or single collectible product uh, will lose value, uh, especially given how excited the NFT market is. There is a much higher chance that NFT ecosystems with through lines and utility uh, will be able to capture and grow value. Uh, and obviously, there are some that have already proven that they can withstand bear markets and come back even stronger. Uh, so, you know, those are interesting places to look uh, as well. You know, it's a it's a wonderful time of experimentation uh, in the NFT industry. So I think there's going to be a lot, uh, a lot of big winners. And I think what you're about to see is going to truly shock a lot of people as to how mainstream this is going to be. Uh, people are really underestimating what's coming. So how did you spend that thousand dollars? I wanted some names of coins. <laughs> okay, um, yeah. So you know, looking at uh, top projects, you, know, you have a really interesting project with Ecomi. You have interesting projects, uh, like obviously Engine really held through the bear market. Obviously, it didn't hold value, but it came back even stronger. Um, obviously, uh, there's really interesting experiments with how NFTs are being um, treated as assets uh, a little further down the market caps. Um, so I would be spreading out, you know, I'd, I'd be spreading out my bets because it's really not clear. It's so early. It's not clear which ecosystems are going to deliver the winning toolkit. So it's important that you just kind of diversify because one of these uh, is going to be the Amazon, the Google, the Netflix, uh, to, for lack of a, a better way to explain it. But there are going to be some absolute monsters in the NFT space. And they're going to be bigger, in my opinion, than anybody really wants to admit at this point because they see NFTs as kind of playthings. Uh, but these NFT ecosystems that grow will be as big, if not bigger, than uh, a lot of the protocols that you think are, are dominant in crypto. Uh, and so diversify across uh, the, the interesting and, and leading ones. Um, I think there's a really interesting one uh, called Zora uh, that, that has a, a very interesting concept. It's a little different than others. Um, but for the most part, uh, what I'll say is that you know, you'd be best to uh, heavily diversify because uh, the, the space is is growing really fast and we don't know which one is going. Unlike other ecosystems, we don't have like an Ethereum or a Bitcoin of this ecosystem. Uh, so in some ways it's a much more open and a much more uh, accessible world uh, for, for making these kinds of gains, right? And, and growth because uh, there's still not a clear uh, champion uh, winner. And I think there, there will be over time, a couple of these protocols that absolutely, absolutely take the cake or at least a lot of cake. Elliot, I loved this conversation. Thank you for your time. Final thoughts for the Altcoin Daily audience. A uh, huge thank you for having me. I'm a really big fan of uh, the twins. I've been watching you guys for forever. And, uh, you know, it's, it's just really important that you guys realize uh, that as much as this feels like we are so deep into this, uh, the reality is, is that the overall journey of cryptocurrency is still in its infancy. And uh, the technology is capable of so, so much more. Uh, and 
all of these waves that you're seeing are part of the story, um, but you just really need to understand that this is, if you approach it with a long, long-term mindset of years, not months or days, uh, that there is a huge, huge future for people to get in and be a part of this. And uh, I think uh, Austin and Aaron and I are, are proof of that.